Good evening. Welcome to a very special episode of Trending on the program tonight. One of the biggest and some would say perhaps one of the most controversial political decisions in India's history. Article 370, which gave Kashmir its unique identity and was the basis of the accession to, this, to India, has been virtually scrapped. What's clear is that the unique identity of the state no longer exists. Along with that, there's been a decision to bifurcate the state. So Jammu and Kashmir will be a union territory and have an assembly headed by a lieutenant governor. And Ladakh will also be a union territory, but one without an assembly. It will also have a lieutenant governor. What does this mean for millions of citizens in Jammu, in Kashmir and in Ladakh? That's the big focus on a day when two former chief ministers, Omar Abdullah and Mehbooba Bufti, have been formally arrested and detained in temporary jails. Uh, the state machinery extremely active, worried about any processions, anything which may lead or result uh, in disquiet uh, in the state. Let's give you the, the overall situation, some of the big developments before we start our debate this evening. So the special status to Jammu and Kashmir, we often refer to Jammu and Kashmir having a special status. We often refer to how much autonomy it can have, the demand for more autonomy. Well, that's all gone. Uh, special status, gone. Uh, Article 370 on special status is essentially been scrapped. I think a, a more appropriate way of looking at it is that it is no longer operative. So Jammu and Kashmir will no longer be a state in the same way that it was before about, what, 9.30 or 10 this morning. Jammu and Kashmir becomes, or a little after that, Jammu and Kashmir becomes a union territory with an assembly. Ladakh, as I mentioned, becomes a union territory without an assembly. So a lot of people would call this a downgrade in Jammu and Kashmir or of Jammu and Kashmir. And the larger issue, has democracy in the state been subverted? One way or the other, the state is in a state of utter, complete lockdown. Leaders have been arrested. And the reason we aren't getting too many reports of what the on-ground situation in the state is, is simply because it's not possible to get these reports. Media crews not allowed across various parts of the state, restrictions on movement, Telephone lines continue to be down, broadband is down, mobile data is down, uh, a curfew in many parts of the state, not all parts of the state, uh, freedom of small assemblies has been restricted as well. In this situation, getting accurate information on the ground from journalists, not really possible. Well, joining us now uh, to, to take a look uh, at, uh, at all of this, uh, my, uh, my former colleague uh, Maya Michindani with me here in the studio, Aarti Jairat with us uh, as well. Hitesh Jain, the lawyer and member of the BJP, uh, joins us in a few moments as well. Lieutenant General Atta Hasnain, uh, the former Corps Commander of 15 Corps uh, with us. Uh, and Dr. Geeta Bhatt, uh, ac academic and political analyst, someone close to the RSS. Thanks, ma'am, very much for being with us. In fact, Dr. Bhatt, let me come to you first. The announcement today is a macro level announcement. It speaks about the future of Jammu and Kashmir. We can't even refer to that. It speaks about the future of Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. My question is this, um, given the fundamental disconnect which exists uh, on the ground in Jammu and Kashmir with all sorts of policy and the center, how do we attempt or how is anybody going to bridge that gap through these new policies? Uh, well, um uh, Vishnuji, uh, you know, the first point is that, you know, in the, uh, if we look at the timeline of any nation, you know, there are certain movements which are very defining. And I think this has been one of, you know, one of the most, uh, uh, you know, bold and uh, historic decisions which has taken place today, uh, which actually is uh, going to play a very significant role, you know, in the but development how? of, I'll come to that, and, you know, and especially I think for people like us, you know, who, some those who, who who were not there, you know, at the time when India got independence, you know, being a part of, uh, you know, witnessing such an important decision, I think no, that no, no, itself but, but, is but very you welcoming. See, this is my and real fear, yeah. Dr. Bhatt. No, no, and I'll, I, I, I'll give, give me, you lots of time to answer. At least give me one, one minute you to have speak and of then. Time. Yeah, but give I me disagree one, with one what minute you're saying. To, I, you may disagree, but let me complete yeah, and then ahead. you can counter me. No issues on that. So, but the point is that, at least on one point you will agree yeah, with me, yeah. and that is that, you know, when in our constitution, when mm -hmm. the preamble, when we try to say, you know, a, a unified country and a secular country, yeah. constitutionally, actually, it is today that we have actually become yeah. secular. See, I don't, I don't disagree with a word of what you're saying. It, uh, from, from a macro standpoint, it seems 
something which is plausible, uh, something which has been done, I'm sure, with the best intentions of the people of Jammu and Kashmir and the people of India. I'm asking about the fundamental disconnect which exists between large majorities in Jammu and Kashmir and people outside the state. How you are see. you going to get people in Jammu and Kashmir who believe in their identity, who believe in that autonomy, uh, to, to, to accept overnight that it's all gone? How? How do you, how do you make that gap? Bridge you that see, gap. Uh, you know, when you talk about identities, it is not that the people who are living in other parts of the country, they do not have their own unique identities. Each one of them, whether you look at the, but the southern states or whether you, are, you look at the eastern states, or the circumstances, yes, circum are circumstances have Indian been Union created. You yes, know, for the last created. 70 years, yes, they were created and they exist. They exist, but they and, have and, been and created. And overcoming that would be a and problem. They have been created, and they have been created over this Article 370, which very categorically has been written as something which is temporary, which was temporary and transitional. Yes, now, it was. Now, you so if you if you're trying to look at it in whether it is in constitutional terms or whether no, in I'm legal not looking terms, at it in those terms. The, in I'm not getting into the legality of it because there are two arguments. Right. In fact, Maya, let me come to you next as somebody who's covered Jammu and Kashmir extensively. How do you bridge the fundamental gap between what people in the state think, people whose voices we are unable to hear today, uh, and, and what political leaders over here believe is the right course ahead for, for Jammu and Kashmir? How do you bridge that gap? You know, Vishnu, I think uh, I'm at a loss, frankly, to answer that question today because from the morning, I've been thinking about Prime Minister Modi's last few visits to the Kashmir Valley. I've been thinking about what Prime Minister Vajpayee said and what his approach on Kashmir was, Insaniyat, Jamuriyat, Kashmiriyat. And I'm thinking about what happened today. And there is no reconciliation in a sense between that because on the one hand you have, you have, you know, an acknowledgement that there is a perception battle that needs to be fought and needs to be won. And there is a reality of security. There is a reality of history when it comes to the Kashmir conflict. Today, I think we're seeing that perception doesn't matter. History doesn't matter. It's just brute force and the might of the state. Yeah. And I think when, when that is really the way that, uh, the, the method that's being used, that's being employed to achieve a political objective based on an election campaign and a manifesto, I don't know what room there is how, it, to, to bridge this gap. I, I don't see the okay. bridge anymore today. General Hasnain, um, a lot of your leadership uh, in the in the army, certainly when you were in Kashmir, certainly when you were a corps commander, was based on a very deliberate effort to win the hearts and minds yeah. of people, right? Now, different institutions, different organizations would achieve that goal through different methods. But how can we win the hearts and minds of millions of our citizens who don't trust a decision like one that has been taken today? Will we have to wait 20 years before something like this is accepted? Or are we going to look at a situation when it's never going to be accepted? Are we going to look at a situation when it's more of the same, except it's written differently? See, Vishnu, there is no doubt about it <coughs> that we should have done much more <coughs> many years ago about uh, cultivating the Kashmiri population, the awam, reaching out to them. And... Uh, getting them to accept the fact that they are part of India and at some stage, inevitably, the special status of Jammu and Kashmir would have to go. I don't think we ever made a sincere effort towards that. Especially after 1989, our efforts have been superfluous. Uh, even my own efforts, I know, as a corps commander, were primarily more towards a little bit of appeasement to a return of self-esteem among the people and uh, uh, things of that nature. But the larger issues, constitutional issues, the status of Jammu and Kashmir, their relationship with Pakistan, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship with India, I don't think we ever had uh, went to the people to discuss this. And I, for one, was always believing before this decision that yes, Article 370, 35A, everything must finally go. Must it go today? Should it go tomorrow or should it go the day after tomorrow? Okay. That was the question in my mind. Now uh, that the decision has been taken, yes. now that the government has taken a democratic decision, a majority government with a strong majority in the Lok Sabha, in the Rajya Sabha also nearly. Yes. I say now, I think it's incumbent on us to support this 
and yeah. let's reach out to the people in a very different way. No, absolutely, again, and and, and I think I think time. general, uh, there's no, it's it's the law now, right? And it has to it has to work, and we all want it to happen peacefully. I think what I'm trying to get at is how how is that really going to work? Uh, let me just go across to uh, Dr. Samir Kohl, spokesperson of the National Conference. Uh, Omar Abdullah has uh, been arrested uh, and put uh, behind, not behind bars, he's been taken to a guest house. Uh, it's uh, called a subsidiary jail, as it were. What did he do uh, to get the authorities to act in this manner? And Mehbooba Mufti faces the same predicament. The national conference on whose shoulder this conditional accession to India took place is appalled and is shocked at the continuous betrayals that we have faced after our decision. Because earlier betrayals were political betrayals, but this was a complete constitutional betrayal. No, but what, what, what did Omar do? My question is specific. And the way it was conducted. Samir, my question is specific. Now, I, I, we'll talk about your, the larger thing. That's why I was coming, I was, I was coming, I was coming to the fact that how the whole thing was conducted. Yes. Now, if the government of the day feels that a party which has tried its level best by paying with the death of more than 8,000 of its workers over the years with their blood for this country, the leader of that party, all he, when he do, all he does is tries to calm his people saying that God will solve the problem, don't take law into your own hands, be calm and cool and things will get better, be treated in this manner. It just speaks of a Xinjiang kind of a model. Okay, so in basically China what you're saying is that all that Omar did almost was like he tweeted. Decree, there were a couple of tweets they happened the before place. he was put under house arrest. It is and you believe it's the, big, his arrest it is, today is on the basis and of those that. tweets and those tweets were not inflammatory. What do you do? You're, the whole it's not only Omar. The whole state is locked up. There is no landline working. There's no internet. There is nothing. And there is a huge presence, and that bogey of war, which we always create, okay. and the attack okay. on the Amarnath Yatra, and till the other day, okay. we were accused of rumor mongering. Yeah, Samir, one, one moment, I want we, to go across to my other panelists along. also, you know, so I will come idiots. back to you in a moment from now. Uh, Aarti, the messaging of it all over the last couple of days. Number one, the role of the governor, where the governor says, look, I don't really see anything seriously which is going to change. Then everything changes. Of course, there was a little bit of a rider where he said, but you know, I'm, I may not know everything, right? But why did he make the statements to Mehbooba Mufti, to Omar Abdullah, to ANI, to India Today, saying that, you know, I don't see anything really happening, right? Is he not part of the process? So messaging over there, question mark. Number two, the entire effort by the security establishment to explain that there's a very serious threat to the Amarnath Yatra, mm -hmm which is true, absolutely, 100%, not denying it, recoveries have been made. But we faced this threat in the past, why did Yatris have to go, right? Why could the establishment not protect them? And how is that a reason to, do this. to sort of trigger a process of change like it is? I, can you, are you able to fill, you know, the puzzle? <laughs> no, absolutely not, yeah. Vishnu. I don't think, uh, you know, I think firstly, yes, as far yes, as the yes, governor is yes. concerned, I think the governor was not in the loop. And he must have been served this as a fait accompli, uh, accompli right at the end, told to sign so that the presidential uh, pro proclamation could be issued. So, you know, I mean, I can understand the governor making all those statements. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the Amarnath Yatris and all are concerned, look, you know, now, I, I mean, if we go back to events that have happened over the last one week, the way the government went about with these controversial bills in the Rajya Sabha, you know, yeah. the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, the Triple Talaq, the right RTI Amendment, you know, and the way they managed to get their numbers in the Rajya Sabha to get these bills through. I think those were floaters, those were trials, those were test runs, really. To, for this really big step which they have taken today. The fact that they were able to get those three bills through quite easily gave them the courage and the, you know, the will or the strength to go ahead with this major move, which I think they have been planning for quite some time. 
Right. Uh, you know, I mean, it's very interesting that in their manifesto, the BJP's manifesto of 2014, they talked about scrapping Article 370, but they said after consultations with all stakeholders. Yeah. That phrase was omitted in their 2019 oh. manifesto. Yeah. Now, why was that omitted? I mean, clearly they had a plan in mind and that plan has been there for some months now. Yeah. You know, and what is interesting, you know, because I want to go back to your original question of yeah. how do you bridge the gap? Yeah. You know, how does this play out domestically? Outside of Kashmir, I think there is widespread support for Absolutely. what the government Huge has support. done. Huge support. Yes. And they are riding now again this wave of nationalism. And in Kashmir, most people won't nationalism. know what's happened. And, and even if they know, it's word of mouth. Yeah, Nothing it's official. word of mouth. Yeah. But I mean, when the people of Kashmir do get to know what has happened, I mean, I think the reaction there will be quite different. Again, in Jammu, I think the reaction is quite different. I think in yeah. Jammu also, there's a lot of support for this. Yes, of course. So, you know, the divisions, the cleavages. And there's the certainly cleavages. support in Ladakh as well. Yes. Uh, Ladakh, yeah. of course, has been demanding union territory status for a long in time. In a very They've polite manner. In a very polite manner. And it was the promise of the MP who has been elected yes. from Ladakh. It was his election okay. campaign. Okay, I, I just that. also, in, so in all of this... So the cleavages are very, very deep. Sure. And how is the government, by putting in you know, hundreds and thousands of troops into uh, Jammu and Kashmir, how are they going to resolve this? Okay. I mean, when they reach out to the people of Kashmir, can so they do it through the armed Arti, forces? you know, we've got a very special guest today because there's another side of this entire story uh, that we've not really focused on. Uh, Justice uh, C. Mukherjee, the former Chief Justice of the Calcutta High Court and the Mumbai High Court, uh, the nephew of uh, Shama uh, Prashad Mukherjee. The Shama Prashad Mukherjee's... Uh, association with with Kashmir, his desire to ensure that 370 went away is something we haven't spoken about. To that end, what the BJP sees today to be is something which is based on, uh, on their history, uh, their beliefs over a long period of time. Before I go across uh, to Justice Mukherjee, uh, I just want to bring out a small timeline from Shama Prashad Mukherjee to Narendra Modi. Uh, Article 370 from 1950 to 19 uh, to 2019. So let's bring up uh, that graphic package if we can. Now, the Sung 67-year-old campaign uh, to scrap uh, Jammu and Kashmir's Article uh, 370 in 1952, the Jan Sang Shama Prashad Mukherjee was somebody who led the effort. He said, you can't have one nation, uh, in, in, but, but two con uh, constitutions. He died in Srinagar jail. Um, uh, after uh, you know, after a, a, a struggle for a long time. So let's play out uh, a couple of those points that we have. Uh, in 1952, it was uh, Mr. Mukherjee who started the campaign to scrap 370. He said, "Can't have one nation, but two constitutions, two prime ministers, and two flags." He said that that was entirely untenable. As I mentioned, he died in Srinagar jail after being held demanding Jammu and Kashmir's complete integration. Now, the BJP obviously replaced the Jansang, but they did retain the scrap 370 demand as very much a core demand. And the BJP observes Mukherjee's death anniversary as Martyrdom Day. Uh, Narendra Modi has spoken about uh, the need to scrap 370 many times uh, in the past in political campaigns. So the point is that this is an issue which is very, core, which is very keen uh, to, to, to the BJP's beliefs. Uh, and... Uh, Justice Mukherjee, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us. Uh, would Shama Pra Pra Prashad Mukherjee have gone about this in quite the same manner, that in a period of a few hours, Article 370 disappears? How would he have done it? Well, I do not know. I can't predict that so far his views about Article 370 is concerned. He was opposed to this, as you have said, that he wanted one uh, constitution, one leader, one flag. But how to achieve this? Well, that, that must change with the course of events which occur from time to time. Therefore, it's not for me to say what would have adopted. He did court arrest. He was lodged in a jail, but exactly died when he was gravely ill, he was taken to an hospital only to die without any of his dear and dear dear ones with him. And the information came to us. For us, his death has been a personal tragedy for all of us in the family, which had shaken us very much. 
about the sagacity or the or the the wiseness of taking the measure today yes. i have hardly anything to say because i don't belong to politics therefore not for me to make any any express any view about what should have been done to to remove a temporary provision and uh, making discrimination and differentiation about the implementation of laws from one part to another of india union Do, uh, justice mukherji uh, geeta bhat has a question for you is that you wanted to you had a I point to make go ahead i just wanted to add what uh, justice has just said uh, i mean we all are aware that uh, you know before uh, shama prasad mukherji you know took up this agitation and you know uh, in protest before that we had actually had to take a permit to go to uh, jammu and kashmir it oh, is only know. yes and it is only after that he protested and he had to pay through his you know by through his life it is only after that that the central government decided to scrap that permit and people could actually travel just like to any other part and it is not just shama prasad mukherji but i think even baba saab ambedkar mm -hmm. today would be very very happy to see this what has happened today because he was totally against and in fact as a law minister he had told uh, uh, sheik abdullah when he talked about article 370 that how do you expect that you know we india should protect your borders make you know build roads for you but you do not want any kind of an interference from us as a law minister i will never permit article 370 okay. he was totally against it justice mukherji uh, how did shama prasad mukherji deal with the entire issue of identity and autonomy in kashmir did he believe that these terms were alien to what uh, to what india should be uh, did he did he accept it in in some form or was he just opposed to uh, the entire issue of two constitutions well it is not merely a question of form it is a question of views about the uniformity and unity of the country In fact, before I mean he became the minister, he had long time striven before the partition to keep India together. But then I mean the so far as the movement which led to his participating in uh, against the um, permit system in Kashmir, mm -hmm. he had gone there with the full knowledge, and he wanted to establish uh, that the India being one nation. in one constitution there should be no bar to entering kashmir and that is a part of his philosophy that there should not be anything special which deviates from the unity which this constitution has tried to achieve to a large extent justice mukherjee one last question to you and i urge you not to be diplomatic is this a, a day of 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 celebration for you and your family Uh, at at what has happened uh, are you celebrating this uh, I, the the memory of of shama prasad mukherji uh, what he stood for is it a day of of celebration or are you just observing this from a distance it's not a matter of celebration we continue to grieve about him because he died in the prime of his life but what it is if you put it correctly is a matter of satisfaction right. that what he tried to achieve has now been achieved that's a matter not a matter of political uh, uh, decision but it is a matter for us for the family consolation not celebration it's a consolation a little bit of i'm in mean, thinking that after all has been achieved maybe not in the way you could have been done in those days when he lived but he did try and now the success has come in unifying the country in the matter of application of laws yes. and the provisions of the constitution to all parts of our country satisfaction and consolation the two key words are picked up from that last answer of yours uh, justice mukherji the former chief justice of calcutta high court and the mumbai high court thank you sir the bombay high court thank you very much sir for speaking to us we're going to continue this discussion after a short break tehsil punawala waiting uh, to join us i've kept a lot of our panelists waiting there's a lot more to discuss over here including the ground situation it's coming up so how did it all work out in jammu and kashmir uh, when was the decision to actually go ahead with this uh, taken 
Uh, I, we tried to get a couple of details on this, uh, which explain not just the process leading up to the big announcement today, but the security preparation on the ground. And here's how, how it went. And here's what exists on the ground. Well, 11 days ago, the Home Ministry gave officials in Jammu and Kashmir a deadline. Today was the deadline. By 2 p.m. on Monday, yesterday, the state administration was all ready. Now, senior officials of the Jammu and Kashmir government have told NDTV the steps on the ground are unprecedented. Such measures have never been taken since 1971 when India and Pakistan fought a war that resulted in the liberation of East Pakistan. It all began with the deployment of CRPF personnel. 430 companies of CRPF jawans were deployed. They were moved in to their positions by early evening yesterday. Now, that is 43,000 jawans, but that's... A, it's, it's a huge number, but the numbers are actually f far more significant because many more Jawans would already have been deployed over there. On the ground, a decision had been taken to remove mobile bra broadband services by late last night. The goal was very clear, control the flow of information, prevent rumors, and ensure that there is no violent reaction. Satellite phones, which have been widely distributed to security forces and wireless communications, form the backbone of the communications grid at the moment. To deal with the large-scale breakdown in law and order, riots are a big concern. 60 additional special executive magistrates have been deployed. These have been described to me as being mobile magistrates, empowered to make speedy arrests and assist security forces. Those arrested in the Greater Srinagar area will be housed in at least six temporary jails. Uh, Omar uh, Abdullah and Mehbub Mufti have been jailed in temp have been jailed and put in these temporary jails. Uh, these have been prepared with large-scale political arrests in mind. Now, government doctors who were not on duty have been brought in to deal with any eventuality. Guest houses have been sealed after Amarnath Yatris and tourists were ordered to leave. Uh, perhaps for the first time ever, the state administration in Srinagar ordered outstation journalists to move out of their hotels and shift to a hotel in a heavily defended part of central Srinagar, one hotel. Government officials say that this was done to ensure the safety of journalists in the area. Though banks do have enough cash and fuel stocks are plentiful, the possibility of curfew being imposed means that banks and fuel stations may be shut. Asked how long the security clampdown will continue, senior government officials said, expect this to be a long haul, which was likely to continue till Independence Day. For now, quite clearly, it's wait and watch. Let me go across uh, now to, to Tehseen uh, Ponawala, who joins us, as does Lieutenant General Satish Dua. Uh, in fact, let me come across to, to General Dua first. Uh, General Dua, the manner in which they've deployed forces, by which I mean primarily the CRPF on the ground, the, the, the manner in which things have been quiet, no leaks have been allowed, uh, this was obviously which took a great deal of planning. And by the grace of God, thus far, we are told that there's been no violence on the ground. Hello. Yeah, General Dua, could, could you hear me? Yeah, uh, Vishnu, I could not hear the last last sentence after the, in what it took a great deal of planning. Yeah, no, I just want you to comment process. on the manner in which they've gone about preparing the ground for this decision. Right. Uh, Vishnu, uh, right now it's pretty obvious that... Uh, while there was a uh, heated LC, there were uh, intelligence inputs uh, that would, uh, that pointed towards disruption of the Yatra, etc., that we have been hearing in the last uh, few days. Uh, there is also um, always this element of uh, relief of troops that is carried out because the Amanath Yatra is an extended Yatra and troops come in. However, the numbers that came in were more. So, uh, the 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 security grid has been tightened to such an extent that whether it is because of intelligence inputs to disrupt the yatra or create mayhem in the state otherwise or if there is going to be agitation that spills on the street as we see as we uh, as we perhaps anticipate now the security grid is fully in place whether from across the border or by the terrorists if there is going to be any mischief now in this present in the present uh, situation okay um, we're also joined by mr vikas singh senior advocate in the supreme court former additional solicitor general of india 
Uh, Mr. Singh, from a legal standpoint, a constitutional standpoint, uh, would it be correct to say that Article 370 hasn't been abrogated? It actually continues to exist, but essentially it's been made inoperative. Would that be a correct way of, uh, of analyzing what's happened from a legal standpoint? <clears throat> well, if you look at the um, constitution when it was made and go into the constituent assembly debates, the three reasons why they brought in 370 were that Kashmir was, you know, under some kind of a ceasefire. There was a there was a warlike situation there. The Kashmir issue was also a dispute referred to the UN. And lastly, there was a constituent assembly in the state, and they felt that till the three things are there, it is proper that we should have some kind of a transitory provision, so that only thereafter if at all the repeal has to take place or its operation has to take has to be sort of uh, renewed it could be renewed so if you will then further see that the uh, curfew situation the ceasefire situation became over in a couple of years 57 the constituent assembly also was uh, over and the state legislature came in and from the 60s literally the un also gave up this issue and 2010 un actually removed it as a dispute pending for adjudication with the UN. Yes. So really, and, and if you see 370 once again, 370 is a very unique article which gives the power to the President of India or rather the executive yes. to withdraw that provision because it is meant to be a transitory provision. You don't have to go back to the parliament for amendment of that uh, provision. So any time after these three things had gone over, I mean they could have easily done it and I and I think that uh, as far as the constitutional aspect is concerned, uh, there can be no infirmity because it is well within the power. Of course, you are right, the 370 will remain. 370 can be revived at a later date if the government feels that the situation has changed further to you know, um, bring about certain changes in the, uh, in this, in the situation in the state. But if the, if the government feels, of the government of the day feels that 370 is no more relevant today, yep. then it will be very well justified in doing so because that is what the constitution makers had intended and that is why the constitution maker had made this kind of a provision in the constitution. So legally there is no impediment and uh, um, uh, as you rightly pointed out there is no violence. Okay. So it has been done with a lot of planning. And I, I will in that sense you know, say that uh, the home minister and the yep. home secretary uh, have taken a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, detailing in uh, implementing okay. this decision. Maya, um, the other part of this, and a lot of people would say that 370 by now had been largely hollowed out, hmm. uh, but the decision to bifurcate, uh, and, and one of the points which political leaders in the state would, uh, uh, would argue is that, look, uh, earlier we used to report, there used to be a governor, now there goes, there's going to be a lieutenant governor. Yeah. In the case of Ladakh, there's not even going to be an assembly. Uh, so this is a demotion politically, right, for all the political parties in Jammu and Kashmir. What does that mean for these parties? I think that's a very good question. And I think, again, the answer to that is something that will only become clear once we know when this current state is going to change. Um, but just to sort of come in on, from a slightly different perspective on this as well, I mean, there's two things. One is as we were discussing earlier, there's hu huge support mm -hmm. for what the government has done today. No question about mm -hmm. it uh, across the country. Yes. One country, one constitution. And frankly, you know, who is, who's really going to argue with something like that? I think the, the question is the brute force that is, seems to be on display. So it's not that, you know, it's the it's 370 which is the law has been breached or things like that by by the government having done this but the spirit i think has been breached that's one but the, the second thing on timing and this is a question that's been coming up a lot what was the rush why suddenly now why in the middle of the yatra uh, you know why get everybody out of their advisories i th there's one school of thought that says that this is closely tied to the fact that Trump has made two statements on mediation on Kashmir in recent weeks. Both have been rejected. And we have to be seen um, to act. That's one. Imran Khan and Trump had a meeting. Uh, there's this entire 
concern about what's going to happen with the Afghan peace process and what happens when uh, you know the Taliban is back uh, in the game right. in a really serious way. It, what is the security threat? So, in fact, one of the narratives on the weekend was that there's this, there's an imminent threat about fo foreign fighters coming into Kashmir yeah, and but, they're just fortifying but the borders. That, 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 was, so, that was bizarre, you know, so, because we so, face these threats so many so times. So, what I'm saying is it's also an, then an easy narrative to sell, right? Because they're, you're fortifying the borders, you need to move your troops in. Who's going to argue with this? General Nobody's going to argue with this. General Dua, you want to come in over there? You know, for, we've been chatting now for the last couple of days. We were focusing on what appeared to be uh, you know, a, a military or a, a, a law and order, a, a security situation along the line of control. The, today, it's quite clearly it's a political move, and if there's any security angle in it, it's it's the CRPF. So, I don't know. In terms of messaging, uh, you know, was 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 the focus perhaps unnecessarily on the line of control? Were we perhaps wrongly looking at the line of control, particularly since a lot of the attacks which we spoke about have happened many times in the past? Perhaps the focus all along for a lot of us should have been internal security and political change. Uh, well, in hindsight, uh, Vishnu, what you say uh, is right. Uh, uh, we, should, we should have been focusing on this fine. But, you know, it's, uh, uh, hindsight is always 20, 20 by 20. Uh, it's a very complex situation that we've been living in the, for the past three decades over there. As I see now, there, there is no denying the fact that the LC is heated up. There yeah. is no denying the fact that there are these inputs, uh, uh, very uh, worrying inputs about them wanting to create some big incident and that yes. we've spoken in the last few days, uh, especially after Pakistan got a little bolstered with the uh, Prime Minister's visit to the US, their Prime Minister's visit to the US. So after this, there was this uh, sense of foreboding sense uh, of something big going to happen. While that is true, but then now we realize that this was also in the making and this was happening. And from a security perspective, I feel uh, uh, it's a, it's from a security standpoint, it's, it's a very good bold step, a good step. And uh, let's hope that it is a proper uh, rollout of the development has been, has been planned. Uh, yes, there. Uh, there is there is more to it since we did not have a consultative process so we need to take a make a very good narrative now to engage with the people but to engage with the youth okay the youth mind space is very the mind space of youth is very important this is what we have been missing out for last uh, a few years uh, now the point here is that we if we engage with the youth youth and there is proper development aspirations of the youth are met then uh, we, we will see a mindset change. To, uh, I mean, but General, with all due respect, we've been talking about the youth forever uh, and, and engaging them. Yes. It's, there, there's, uh, you know, a big sh difference between what, what, we, what we say and what we've achieved on the ground. And I think that's the problem. Aarti, go ahead. Yeah, also, I'd, I'd like to I, ask, I know, you know, I mean, these are all very noble intentions and I'm sure, you know, this is what should be done. But I think there's a very serious question here. Who are going to be your interlocutors? Hmm. I mean, who who is going to do the reaching out to the people of Kashmir? And, and the BJP, who? the BJP at the moment does not have the credibility. You know, it just doesn't, and it's just done this major move, taking away Article 370. However popular it may be outside Kashmir, it cannot be popular with the Kashmiris. So, who is going to do the reaching out to the Kashmiris, assuage their feelings, explain to them? Gita, how, how would you, know, you? Who's going to do this you, for you them? You want to take that reaching well, out to? Uh, you see, you know, if you if. Uh, um, that this talk about the disgruntled youth and you know, so the fact remains that you know the political parties in uh, Kashmir they have been for a very long time you know for their own vested interests they have always uh, tr have tried that there should be you know a explosive situation there in terms of whether it is terms of instigating the youth over there somehow this you know this uh, fabricated disconnect which has already been there that is what this change which is going to bring is actually going to dissolve and I, I am telling you, I mean, you know, that you just see the change. It is going to, the, the, these apprehensions which are there that how the people of the valley, because it is their empowerment, you know, they have been deprived of the empowerment. You know, whether it is about gender rights, we all know what is, yes, you know, the woman yes, of yes, uh, Kashmir, if yes, they marry outside, yes. uh, they, they do not property, get, they yeah. lose their pro uh, yeah. rights to property. Yeah. 
And it is not just that. In terms of right to education, it is not there. Property Act, it is not there. No, that's all there is no way. empowerment yeah. of the people no, no. over there. there now is that is something wrong. which is go which is going to change after that. But There's and lots it wrong. Is We're going only to be, saying who it is, is going, going to, to be a smooth road. Who, there might be hiccups who, in between. Who is going to go out? You and believe talk it's going to be a smooth road? Reach, by and large, I see, there would be hiccups, but. Can I Overall, do, I don't think do it the is outreach. outreach. Who's they, going they to do the outreach? Definitely, the government will come out with a. You, just tell me five years uh, yeah, before, could anyone have ever thought that this kind of thing could ever happen? No, I don't think no? uh, even uh, last night we even could think that something ago, like yeah. this But I just want to make happen. a small yeah. point and it's a minor disagreement. I don't think there is a manufactured disconnect, at least not in the valley, uh, whether it's the youth, whether it's civil society. In the last five years, with all the political turmoil that one has seen in the valley, a uh, particularly post-2016, after Mufti Sahab was, uh, 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 died and yeah. Mehbubha Mufti became Chief Minister, the tensions between the BJP and the PDP, the violence on the street. In fact, it started in the last few years of, uh, yeah. last uh, you know, few months of Omar's term as yeah. Chief Minister as well. The fact of the matter is, there has been a growing gulf between Srinagar and Delhi. Now, we can sit in Delhi and pretend that it doesn't exist because, frankly, in the rest of the country, it doesn't exist. The rest of the country sees it the problem within the geographical boundary of Kashmir, but talk to the people there and there is a serious disconnect. The people feel that they are not welcome. We saw what happened in the, in the Pulwama aftermath and how Kashmiri youth in other parts of the country were being, uh, okay. uh, being discriminated and being identified and being profiled. There is a problem and I think Aarti's point is really, really valid because in this particular instance, who are they going to be willing to come across so to the table and I talk to? I don't know if this is going to ease the... This is this, I don't see it being smooth. I don't know how it's going to okay. be smooth, except again by brute okay, force. Okay, just uh, two very brief points. First, uh, uh, to General Hasnain. General, if we flip this around, and now that people outside the country, outside the state, you and I can... Uh, others can go and buy property in Jammu and Kashmir, for example, would people uh, be viewed by Kashmiris with a great deal of happiness. Uh, uh, tourists and others have been welcomed in Kashmir for decades. Uh, 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 people from other parts of the country have been welcomed. But is there a real fear that they will not be welcomed when, when people from outside look to get property, uh, look, to make, uh, look, look to occupy a space which thus far has not been occupied? Vishnu, with your permission, can I just revert back to what Arti was Vishnu, first saying? Can I come on this? And I think she was making a very important point, and you did not refer it to me for the simple reason that actually I am the one who's experienced on this. And let me tell you this aspect. Reaching out is going to be impossible at the moment. The only way of doing it is by doing a trans Peer Panjal outreach. Okay. Between the people of Jammu and the people of Kashmir. Unfortunately, we have all the while been trying to reach out to the people of Kashmir from all over India. Yes. But we created a disconnect between the people within, between Jammu and Kashmir. That's an important I think point, sir. A tremendous amount of stakeholders there. The, there, is a, there are stakes between the business people, the teachers, the gender sensitivities, there are sports people. We do some serious thinking about this. All right. This is the way forward that we should be doing. Yeah. Now coming back to your question. The aspect about sale of uh, property, etc. I have always believed that one of the things which was always there in Kashmir, which we did not notice was that the Larit Grand Hotel was there. The Taj Vivanta Hotel is there. How have all these properties fought over, over all these years? How had there has been a joint... They must have local ownership. Part, part yes, local ownership. Ownership. There's a joint ownership. Yes, precisely. Lawyers have sat. I know that legal luminaries have sat six months trying to find the loopholes. There are lots and lots of loopholes. But your question specifically is a very interesting aspect that the Kashmiri is not happy about this. He's not happy to welcome the Kashmiri Pandit back also. On, on ground, it may seem that everyone is, wants to welcome the Kashmiri Pandit. But search the heart. The property of the Kashmiri Pandit, no one wants to part with that. Because there are people who have grabbed that property. Today. Okay, General, one second. I'm interrupting you only okay. because I'm running short of time. I have a, a small package. Mr. Vikas Singh, if you can, you wanted to come in in one minute. If you can just 
you know, tell us about your thoughts on, you know, outsiders coming in. Will they be seen as outsiders, aliens? <laughs> your, your thoughts on this, sir? Well, well, Vishnu, as far as buying property is concerned, you will be aware that even today in Himachal Pradesh, people from the other parts of the country can't buy property. So just because 370 is repealed or 370 has been made ineffective or 35A goes, doesn't mean that people can get into Jammu and Kashmir and start buying property. There are local laws in place which prohibit buying of such property. Now each one of these laws will now have to be challenged on the envelope of Article 14 or Article 19. Mm -hmm. And it is only once that they are set aside that the question of somebody going and buying property will arise. Because today, the law on that has not been touched. Okay. Unless if the uh, government were to today, while the president's rule is in force, tweak with those local laws also and, you know, sort of I change that's them. A, that's a really this, important... This by itself will not change anything okay. on the ground. So and I don't understand... Step, but it, it, on the I don't ground, understand why, more... why are you saying that people of Kashmir... There's a lot more which needs to be done. That's an interesting that. point, sir, and thanks for, po uh, for raising that. I'm afraid we're completely out of time, but Mr. Singh, that's a point we'll come back to on, in, uh, on future programs at all. How does one actually get to, to buy land in Jammu and Kashmir? Is, is it enough uh, on the basis of what we've seen today? But there have been several reactions on the historic uh, decisions which have been announced today and have been debated in Parliament. Let's listen in to what different political leaders, different voices, uh, are saying on this. You will bear responsibility. मान्य सभापति महोदय ये सत्य नहीं है महाराजा हरि सिंह द्वारा 27 अक्टूबर 1947 को नबी साहब ने कहा कि धारा 370 ऐतिहासिक है मैं इसके विवाद में जाना नहीं मगर मैं जो टीम लेकर आ रहा हूं वो भी ऐतिहासिक है इतिहास अलग वाला भी शर्म की बात है कि जम्मू कश्मीर को आपने नॉन एंटिटी बना दिया एक लेफ्टिनेंट गवर्नर बना के ताकि आप चपरासी भी यहीं से बना ले ताकि आपकी क्लर्क की अपॉइंटमेंट भी यहीं से करे क्या होता हमने देख रहे हैं चार साल से चीफ मिनिस्टर बिचारा पांडिचेरी का रोज आता एक लेफ्टिनेंट गवर्नर उसको काम करने नहीं देता हर चीज के लिए सांस लेने के लिए भी लेफ्टिनेंट गवर्नर के पास जाना जाता something which this country has been waiting for the last 70 years. Even as latest as 2019, our manifesto during the Lok Sabha election was uh, elaborately mentioning the need for the ab abrogation of 370, Article 3, 370. All this is not without consultation. And therefore to think that we've just popped it out of some, uh, you know, suddenly from uh, uh, the hat like a magic rabbit, not at all. Momentarily, you think you have scored a victory. The drum beats that you will hear on the streets will certainly encourage you to believe that you have scored a signal victory, or as one of the honorable members said, you have corrected.
quote unquote, a so called injustice of history. You are wrong, and history will prove you to be wrong, and future generations will realize what a grave mistake this house is making today. You will reduce states to colonies. The other thing that you are doing, dismembering Jammu and Kashmir, dismembering Jammu and Kashmir, for heaven's sake, in the name of the people of India, I appeal to you, don't do that. Jammu Kashmir liya, kahan Baluchistan lege, bio ke lege, aur jo hamara desh ka akhand Hindustan ka jo sapna hai, mujhe vishwas hai, ye desh, ye desh ki sarkar, ye desh ke pradhan mantri aur desh ke guru mantri zaroor akhand Hindustan ka sapna pura karenge. Today is a very black day. Indian constitution has been raped by the BJP government. You played with the sentiments of the people of Kashmir. Sir, what, I'm, what is bothering me for the last few days when the army was completely army personnel to the Rulak time were deployed there? Really, I am by heart is burning because it should not become a Kosovo. Kashmir should not become a Kosovo. Kashmir should not become a East Saimur. Kashmir should not become a South Sudan. This may happen. Aaj sahi arth mein Jammu aur Kashmir Bharat ka hissa bana aaj bana. It's a very proud day because in future we will not have bills which will have the clause which says this will not be applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This is a black Monday. This is a dark day. A dark day for parliamentary democracy. A dark day for federalism. A dark day for constitution. A dark day for the Rajya Sabha. And a dark day for the idea of India. Article 370 was a miscarriage of history. And one of the gravest blunders of the post-independence India. The common man walking in the streets of Srinagar today is rejoicing. I conclude by saying that we are a part of a global world. India today is a part of a global world. And we have no right, no right absolutely, to deprive Jammu and Kashmir being a part of this global world. We won Kashmir. Today you have lost Kashmir. Right. That is, that is the point, sir. That is your point. Okay. We won okay. Kashmir. You have lost Kashmir. Jawaharlal Nehru ji ne bhi kaha tha ki 370 chinta mat karo, ghiste ghiste ghis jayegi. Magar 370 ko itne jatan se samal kar rakha, 70 saal huye ghisi nahi. Aur ab mujhe bataiye. A temporary provision is subsequent to the temporary subder. Sutter Salta Chal Sakta Hake Kab Jaiga, Kesa Jaiga, a thing so Sutter Ke Bhutne, Maha Alga Vadko Mane Vale, Yuauke Mane, Unko Gumra Kerker, a buddy Naraj Giki Bhavna Kariki. Is my point which is some like a Jeruat Niti. Political will chai. Mat Banki Radniti is a upper upper. देश के लिए फैसला करने का जिगर चाहिए था कोई भी लीगल स्क्रूटनी से इस बिल को कोई कुछ नहीं होने वाला है हर लीगल ऐसे ही नॉर्मल परिस्थिति हो जाएगी उचित समय आएगा हम इसको फिर से स्टेट बनाने के लिए हम मैं कहता हूं हमें 5 साल दे दीजिए हम कश्मीर को देश का सबसे ज्यादा विकसित राज्य बनाएं